Welcome to a presentation of the James City County Williamsburg Master Gardener Association. Today's topic, an introduction to rain gardens. Good morning, everyone. I am pleased to introduce Alexandra Cantwell from the Norfolk Botanical Garden. Um, Alexandra graduated from uh, Virginia Tech with a double major in environmental horticulture, uh, landscape design, and contracting. She's been with the Botanical Garden for 11 years, five years as a horticulturist, and uh, then she moved into education where she is now the uh, director of the adult education program. So I'd really like to have you give Alexandra a warm welcome and a thank yeah. you. So this is an introduction to rain gardens and now I only have um, an hour with you guys so I can't get into the deep, deep nitty gritty of this but um, it is really great to kind of talk about what they are, how they work, why we need them and then get you guys started and teach you how to start that process. So rain gardens, um, it's fun to talk on because when I started learning about them, um, 2012 or so, uh, that they had a lot of bad press, I would say. People thought they were weedy. They thought they were um, breeding grounds for mosquitoes and all these kinds of things. And thankfully, over the past, especially the past five years, I've seen a really big surge in people um, embracing them and wanting to put them in their garden. So this is that little introduction. Um, but at first, to kind of go over, you know, what is a rain garden in a sense? Um, these are small gardens that are designed to withstand, or withstand extremes, both really high inundation in wet soil, but also um, periods of drought too. Um, these are also able to uh, process and withstand high concentration of nutrients and things like that that may enter our soil and waterways, um, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus. And um, they collect this runoff from a given area. So it could be from your roof, your driveway. Maybe you have something collecting water off from the road, um, but they use deep rooted native plants to do this. So they're essentially giant sponges. Um, the main thing we wanna do is slow stormwater runoff. We wanna keep as much water on our property as possible, but not in you know a puddle that's sitting there in your yard and not soaking in. So these are kind of a method of green infrastructure. They are a tool and you can make them beautiful as well. So um, again, these are specifically designed gardens to withstand those extremes of moisture and nutrient load. Those are different than bioswales. So those are um, another aspect of green infrastructure. These are specifically designed elements in the landscape that capture things like silt, pollution, and again, store surface uh, runoff. They consist of swale drainage, and you usually see them, they have like this nice kind of gentle slope, these sides to it. Um, you don't want to create a very narrow ditch where this water is going to rush through um, quickly and erode the landscape. Uh, we fill these with lots of vegetation and riprap. So essentially, these are very large rain gardens or a rain garden is a very tiny bioswale. Um, I would love to see more and more of this. Um, we were seeing a lot of these being installed in municipalities up in Pennsylvania at the top of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, they have a lot of making up to do in terms of nutrients they dump into the Chesapeake Bay. So um, there, we've seen a lot of um, positive movement in those regions. And I would love to see a lot of that get adopted around here um, in our on the peninsula and Hampton Roads. Um, but they look beautiful. And if we can see this also, like if we look in the top um, right, there's a lot of biodiversity there too. So you get a lot of that beauty, different color, seasonality, but it's habitat. Um, that's going to be food for wildlife. And it's incredibly functional. So um, you guys can see there's the inflow structure where that water comes in off the roadway and it gives it a place for these to have, um, it, water can go there and then it gives it time for water to soak in. So we can absorb that water and then those plant roots are gonna filter out that uh, those nutrients and pollution that come in. So um, bioswales are incredibly functional. Um, starting to see these in some more developments, housing developments and things like that as well. But again, they're functional and they can be beautiful. So it is a little different than detention and retention ponds. So, you know, we've seen these, um, especially shopping centers, things like that. But detention ponds, they're low-lying areas. They only temporarily hold water, and they slowly let it drain and absorb while it moves to a different location. 
Um, these are really more for like those high intensity flood control situations. Um, whereas retention ponds, they hold water for specific or they hold water indefinitely. And that's where we usually see the fountains added because we want to keep that water aerated. We want to keep that oxygen moving um, and reduce algal growth. So a little bit of different, but these again are all different aspects of green infrastructure. So why do we want to add these rain gardens? Um, we want to limit impervious surfaces. Impervious surfaces are things like asphalt. It's those hard surfaces, concrete, driveway, rooftops, things like that, um, because water does not infiltrate. That water all collects and it's going to run off into uh, the street gutters. The street gutters then, it's picking up pollution, it's picking up sediment, it's picking up all these things, and it's moving it um, to probably the next drainage ditch. And there we see all that water moving fast, high velocity, wherever it drains out into, it's going to cause erosion issues. It's going to pick up more sediment. It's going to erode the bank away. Um, so stormwater runoff is the issue we are trying to fix. And rain gardens can help with that. Um, rain gardens, again, are just big green sponges that we have. They're letting that water soak in. They're letting that water slow down and get absorbed. And they're acting as filters and picking up those pollutants. So essentially, we want to recreate um, and enable the natural water cycle. So they help us manage stormwater. They help us reduce flooding for that reason. Um, we are seeing more and more intense storm systems that are quick. If we think about in the summer, you know, the summer storms where they come in, they kind of douse you in rain really quick and then they move on. Um, we're seeing those are happening more frequently and they are more intense and they're dumping more rain. Um, in Norfolk, uh, there's lots of underpasses and the tunnels, things like that. Those underpasses, um, if anyone's familiar with Norfolk, Hampton Boulevard near Old Dominion, um, I have seen numerous cars get totaled in the past three years where people are stuck in traffic. And this happened to me and it is terrifying. You're stuck in traffic. All of this rain happens. It's a 15 minute storm, if that. And we have a high rain intensity for just five of those minutes. All that water goes to the low point. Low point around there is under the underpass. And if you're stuck in traffic and everybody's trying to get out and you just can't move, I've seen cars get totaled because they flood that quickly. Um, one rain garden isn't gonna solve that and save somebody's car, but we need to think about designing where we live to help slow that stormwater runoff. Um, we see that happen in areas of high development where they're losing their green space. So we just have high impervious surfaces. We have all those places that don't absorb water, just gets funneled somewhere else. So um, these rain gardens are a wonderful solution um, for you guys um, to learn about, to teach. You can do it at home and that's what we'll get into with this, but um, you guys have a lot of influence and I know you have volunteer hours and things like that, that a lot of you guys get with your master gardener programs and whatnot. Um, so it's important to kind of learn and teach other people about these topics and how we can use plants as a tool. Um, they filter pollution. Those plant roots, which we'll talk about selection and all the good stuff, they are, again, filtering out things like nitrogen and phosphorus and that before it enters our waterways elsewhere. Um, they're replenishing our groundwater. So um, again, back where I live, uh, depending on the time of year, the tides, the wind, I might have to change how I drive home. Um, one of my neighborhoods um, floods all the time now. <laughs> and um, part of that back home is not only do we see sea level rise, but we also see land subsidence. So our aquifer is getting depleted. So not only do we have water rising, but our land sinking. So we're one of, I think, the second most vulnerable community in the U.S. facing that threat. So behind New Orleans. Um, so having green infrastructure allows water to recharge our groundwater, or allows water to seep in and recharge our groundwater. Provides habitat. Um, again, when we include all these deep-rooted, amazing plants, and we're not just using turf, uh, we're creating a lot of habitat. We're creating places for insects to live. We're creating nesting material for birds. We're putting out all these great sources of food for our wildlife. Um, if we reduce flooding, if we manage stormwater, that's going to reduce strain on sewer systems, especially older ones, the combined sewer systems. Um, this is going to reduce erosion. Uh, again, the more roots and plants we have in place, we're slowing the quickness with which that water moves, but we're also having those roots hold that soil in place. Um, in the long run, they are lower maintenance. These plants, once you get established, um, you really only have weeding periodically to keep invasives out until the plants get to a certain size, and then you cut them up, um, down at one point of the year. They add aesthetic appeal. Um, you can increase 
property value, 13 to 30% with a well landscaped area. So that's not just your home, but for business owners, you have increased foot traffic and increased sales. These are all things that have been studied. Um, we have increased visitation. Um, we have increased employee productivity. Schools have shown with um, areas of, um, if you can see outside, if you can see green areas, um, they have students perform better, focus more. Um, so that's another reason we wanna include these green spaces where around where we live. And with that, um, stormwater kind of encompasses most of those reasons. We can kind of tie back all those bullet points into stormwater management. Um, again, we want to make sure that we are kind of designing to move back towards a natural system. So we just want to have as many different types of textures that slow down that rain. Um, when we look at a forest canopy, we've got trees that are the first line of defense. They have all different leaf shapes. That's going to slow rain as it has to hit those leaves, filter, slow down, drip down, move to the next level. Then it hits maybe smaller trees underneath that canopy. We've got shrubs, and then we have the ground layer, and litter, and leaf litter, all that stuff. So having vegetation slows down that rain as it falls. And then we also have area for that to absorb. So again, just to kind of compare that to an impervious system, everything's flat, everything's smooth. It moves pretty quickly for the most part. Um, with that runoff, again, it's picking up pollutants, it's picking up trash, it's picking up all those things. And if we can have an area for that to collect and slow down and um, trap that debris, uh, then we can make a bigger impact and clean it out. What it's shown here on the bottom right side is an example of porous concrete. So there's certain areas where you can't just put, you know, as much as I would love to and just put plants and gardens everywhere. Uh, we can't necessarily do that all the time, but um, we've seen more and more options available for um, porous substances. So porous concrete, porous asphalt, permeable paving, things like that, um, that is becoming more and more popular and accessible for folks. And that still gives you the stability and the accessibility and the structure that we need in a lot of situations, but it allows at least some water to infiltrate and slow down. Um, for us as well in our region, um, it's really important that we need this green infrastructure and we slow down that stormwater because we live in a phenomenally unique place. Um, Chesapeake Bay Watershed is home to over 17 million people. Um, so if we want to get everybody on board, planting rain gardens, protecting our water, that can have a big impact. Um, we've got so much shoreline. We've got so many areas that have neighborhoods and business districts and all that that collect and drain and directly enter our waterways. Um, so we are... We have a lot to protect, not just the quality of water, but when we think about pollution moving through, that leads to algal blooms. That impacts a lot of things like our fisheries, our recreation. Um, if we have pollution and sediment moving through, that sediment that's picked up from a construction site, it gets deposited somewhere else. And what we've seen is a lot of that gets deposited over submerged grasses. So like bottom left there, you can see, um, we call them SAVs, submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, that sediment gets deposited there and that is essential blue crab habitat. So anybody that loves crab boys and all that good stuff, um, there's a great segue into why we want to landscape sustainably, uh, because that sediment smothers that and they no longer have their nesting sites. Uh, the state of the bay, uh, we, the most recent one we have is from 2022. Um, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation puts a report card out every two years. Um, and this just, I wanted to show you guys that all of this stuff is closely monitored and we do see positive changes and impacts happening. So, um, how things might change on a large scale. We might not have direct influence as individuals, but the more that we get involved with programs like this, the more that we um, talk about adding rain gardens and things like that, we can make small impacts that do make a difference. Uh, when we talk about what is polluting the Bay and what these rain gardens are helping reduce and prevent, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus are the two main pollutants. Now, obviously our rain gardens aren't going to solve any of that pollution issue with agriculture, um, but urban stormwater, is a category that we would be able to impact and change with this green infrastructure. Uh, the third most prolific pollutant in the Chesapeake Bay is actually just sediment. So again, erosion control through rain gardens will also have a positive impact on that type of pollution as well. And this is just kind of some visuals to show you what um, that erosion looks like and why we wanna slow down and keep as much of that water on our property as long as possible and let it soak in. Um, Again, we think about those curbs with that water moving through, and it's the more water that collects, the higher volume that is, the faster it's going to move, the more velocity it'll have, and it just eats away once it hits a drainage ditch. 
we see more of these intense frequent storms, we see more of that erosion moving through. And what do we see on that bank that's collapsing? It's turf. Turf is better than nothing, but turf does not have the root structure to hold that stuff in place. Um, then we see we can uh, the difference in water quality where that sediment is getting pushed to positive, moved into different waterways. So just a little bit of the visual when I talk about um, how we want to slow storm water down. This is why. And then this is just an aerial of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, North Bay, you can see Baltimore, and this is after heavy rainfall, just the suspended matter. So it does impact quite a bit. And we see those high residential areas and those high agriculture areas um, where we see most of that erosion and pollution being deposited from. And then again, with those pollutants, phosphorus and nitrogen, um, as they enter the waterways, this is an aerial of an algal bloom. So I know if you guys fly out of, if you fly out of Norfolk, I've seen this in the summer, you can look out the window and you can see that water column. You can see what that algal bloom looks like. And again, having those, those pollutants enter the bay, especially in the summer where we see a lot of rainfall, we see high temperatures, um, this is going to block out light, kills off submerged aquatic vegetation, that reduces oxygen, which affects our fish. And again, that's gonna affect our industries in the area as well. And just an aside, turf is considered the largest crop in the watershed. So turf um, is over 3.5 million acres. And when we think about our, our lawns and our landscapes and the classic American dream of having that beautiful, pristine lawn, um, that requires a lot of chemical input and that requires a lot of time for people. And you don't get much return. They're not very functional in terms of reducing stormwater. They have shallow roots. They um, don't provide much for wildlife. And I'm not saying rip out your yards or your turf. That's impossible. But I like to tell folks, think of turf as like an area rug versus wall-to-wall -wall carpet. You can still have those areas. It's like you need an area for kids and grandkids to play. You need an area for your dog. It helps to find a space. I'm, I'm not... Um, it's not realistic to have everybody just remove their lawn, but think about adding more areas of deeper rooted plants like these rain gardens with their native plants. And then also just the plug here, responsibly use fertilizers. Um, and that's not to make anybody feel guilty. Companies intentionally make the instructions and charts in the bags hard to read and complicated because the more inappropriately you use it, the more you buy from them. So, um, there's some little things you can do that kind of help. You know, we don't want to fertilize right before it rains because it'll wash away. If you use that fertilizer in your yard, um, take an extra second with a broom and sweep up the stuff that got on your driveway and your sidewalk back into the grass. Little things like that do kind of add up. And then, um, again, just this, I know we only have an hour, but um, just some just uh, statistics and facts to kind of drive home the impact that we have. The more of us that are familiar with this topic and the importance of adding rain gardens and green infrastructure, the bigger impact we have. And we have a lot of folks in this area that rely closely on the water uh, ways around us. So when it gets into actually installing your rain garden, hopefully now you're motivated or you see the importance of having these rain gardens. They're not just fun, pretty things in your yard, but they are useful tools that we need more and more of. Um, there are some things to keep in mind. We do have features of rain gardens. We do have some um, specifics. You know, it's not just a low point filled with plants. In a loose sense, it could be, but in um, a traditional rain garden, it is an engineered structure. It is an engineered garden. So we have the inflow structure, and that's where we see water um, move in. Uh, we try to corral and direct the water where we want it to go. Um, so the inflow structure, it could be a pipe, it could be a curb cut block, it could be just a small shallow ditch or swale that leads the water to the rain garden. Um, the ponding area, which is where the water collects, the main garden itself, that depression in the soil, um, it allows the water to collect there, and that's where that water can then infiltrate. Um, the native plants are part of that as well. They are a tool in your rain garden. Uh, they need to be able to survive periods of period, or they need to survive periods of inundation. So when we get all of those rains, and I was talking with someone before the presentation, um, we're all in a drought. You know, we got all that rain left over from Helene, and everyone's like, please stop. Like, we just wanted to dry out. And boy, did it dry out. <laughs> We've got sprinklers running constantly at the garden right now. But rain garden plants, they have to be able to withstand both drought and flooding. And we do have a lot of plants that do that very well. Um, rain gardens aren't just a constantly wet garden. They're only going to be wet and soaked for a few days. 
as they help that water, water infiltrate the soil. Um, they're not gonna constantly be soaking wet. Uh, there is a berm, so there's a backside to kind of help that water collect and stay in the area we designed it to. And then the soil as well. So rain gardens um, can be highly engineered soils. If we're doing this as a homeowner, we might amend the soil and use you know, more sand in our soil. We might use more mushroom compost. It depends on the soil sample in your backyard. Um, see all of the wonderful extension name tags so you guys know where to get your soil tests from. Um, libraries as well have those little kits you can pick up. Um, but it's good to understand your soil structure because everybody is gonna be different. Um, I can't give you one formula that works really, really well. Um, and that's gonna work well for the person next to you. Mulch is important. Mulch is going to, one, help filter out pollutants as well. It's going to help conserve water in those periods of drought. Um, it's going to keep those weeds at bay, and it's going to um, also help cycle nutrients slowly back into your soil. So it's a slow-release fertilizer. Um, depending on the size of your rain garden and the volume of water you collect, you might actually have an underdrain and an inflow or an outflow structure. Um, so that would be when we have really, really high flooding period, um, instead of the water just spilling over the berm and collecting in a big puddle, if you're collecting a large area of water, that would be an area that directs it somewhere else. So where do we want to install these? Um, we always want it to be a minimum of 10 feet from the foundation of a building. I see so many rain gardens that have been installed right near the downspout at the corner of somebody's house. Um, and I can understand why you would want to put it there because it's convenient and you have that spout right there. But you do not, like the point of a rain garden is to have that water collect and slowly seep in. And you don't want that to happen right next to your foundation. Um, so we want to make sure that when we design these rain gardens, it is at least 10 feet away from your house. We also want to make sure that these are going to be outside of a tree's drip line. So think about the canopy, where those leaves drop. We don't want to put it right under a tree because when we excavate and create that depression, we don't want to damage those roots. Most of the tree's roots are going to be superficial near the top of the um, soil surface, so we don't want to damage or stress the tree in that way. We don't want to make it um, over top of a septic system, or we don't want to make it near utility lines. Uh, call me utility. That's still, still very much an important part of any kind of landscape design there. And this one is... I leave it in here worded this way because this is an area with less than 12% slope. Um, we generally live in a pretty flat area, right? <laughs> we don't have to. Um, we have to make our rain gardens different um, than a lot of other areas. Uh, we have to make ours shallower and wider. And we see a lot of flat areas, so we can um, be a bit more creative with how we have that water move in, or we can have structures in the rain garden that kind of create lower and higher depressions. Um, I'm really excited about the Garden of Tomorrow construction because around the education center, it's all going to be functional rain gardens, large ones, small ones, and it'll show homeowners different examples of what they look like, the creativity with design. Um, but we have a lot more to work against than um, a lot of other regions just because we do have high water tables. We do have a lot more flat areas. Um, we don't want to place a rain garden where water is already cooling. And in most of my time studying this and dealing with design, um, that is someone's first instinct, just to put it there. And I completely understand why you're like, there's this water that's always, it's, you know, an area of low infiltration, that soil could be really compacted there. And that's why we see that water pooling and puddling after um, rain. But we don't want to put a rain garden there because of that compaction. Rain gardens, again, are supposed to have this soil that lets water permeate and infiltrate through. So what we would do in that situation is, you know, you identify the area of pooling water, and then we have to think and design, how do we get the water away from that area? Do we create a small, shallow ditch? Do we create um, a rain garden uphill from that shallow flat, or that from that um, compacted area with um, the drainage issue? We want to catch the water before it pools there, or we want to pull the water away from there. Because again, we need that soil to be able to let that water infiltrate. So um, a rain garden, we wouldn't necessarily want to put there because also those plants aren't going to thrive in that condition. Because these plants that we're choosing and we're going to learn about in a few minutes are plants that are going to need soil to be dry periodically. And that is not going to let them thrive and function as well as they should. Um, and one thing, again, talking with someone before this, 
um, where are we collecting water from? You know, it might not always be your house. Um, it's your neighbor's house, depending on how the yard is shaped or your neighborhood is shaped. You might have your neighbor uphill from you. And not only do you have rain sheeting off your roof, but you have all of the water from their property coming down to your yard to collect it too. So these are all things that we need to be considering um, for the install of the rain garden. Do you have an area large enough to capture all of that water? Um, do you need to do a couple different rain gardens in separate areas to help capture and divert that flow? Um, it's gonna be different for every person. So again, what rainwater are we capturing? Um, we wanna make sure as a homeowner, we're noting all the impervious surfaces. Um, so again, our roof or driveway, does the road, is the road um, uphill from us and does that water drain in? Um, our neighbor's property from your shed, the roof there, um, just things that we need to note because that'll influence the, um, the size of the garden. And for this, um, again, I only have an hour with you guys, but what I'm, do for this portion, I send an email and this will go out to you guys, but it's a calculator. So all you have to do is plug in numbers and they do all the calculations for you to show you the size of a rain garden you would need. Um, because it's different for every single person. All of your property is different. Um, as much as it would be fun to go through, and I do this with smaller classes, we can calculate that. Um, I found in my experience, it's easier to share the tool with you guys and let you plug and chug on your own. So um, that is something that I share after the presentation that will be distributed to you guys. Um, and it's a really fun tool because it's um, very customizable when it comes to the area you're collecting. It's very step-by-step -step and easy to maneuver through. Um, but you, again, you wanna make sure we know where we're catching water from, and how much we're gonna be capturing. So um, we do have to do a little bit of math with our rain gardens. Um, when you use that tool, it asks the um, how much rain, like the standard rainfall size. For Virginia, majority of the average rain events are gonna be less than an inch for us. Um, but you're gonna calculate that and then it gives you the dimensions of a rain garden you would need. And again, we wanna make sure that that design is being placed minimum of 10 feet from the house. And then, um, the design of the plants is the fun part. Once we realize the size of the rain garden, um, let's, I think it's the next slide, two slides from now, <laughs> um, showing the perimeter and how you can shape it and how like the kidney bean shape, I think is the most common one that we see um, that rain garden in a box design there. Usually we have rain gardens like in a kidney bean shape and this is the inflow area. So, you know, like this might be the downspout of a house. There's a shallow little depression and that just lets the water inflow into this part. Um, once you realize the amount of water that you're collecting and you do those calculations and you plug it in and that formula gives you the area that you need for your rain garden, um, it does the dirty work for you. And then you get to focus on the fun part of actually designing the plants go in there. And at least that's what I think is the fun part, the colors and the different textures and all that good stuff. Um, but again, just a reminder, anytime we do any kind of landscape design, even if it's not a rain garden, we always want to make sure we do a soil sample that's going to save you money in the long run, making sure that you amend the soil so your plants have the best chance of survival and you're not spending money on plants that we put in this garden and then they slowly peter out and die. Uh, we want to set them up for success. So the $10 up front for that soil sample saves you a lot of money down the line um, in any kind of landscape design. We want to do an infiltration test at the proposed site as well. So um, the other thing I'll send out to you guys is a little YouTube video that just like runs you through the um, what a drainage test looks like. It's super easy. You're just going to dig a hole. Um, I've never had luck with getting YouTube videos working in a PowerPoint anyway. So um, I found it was easier just to show you guys the link. Um, but you want to dig a small hole, the site of you where you want your rain garden, um, 12 inches deep, fill it with water, and then you wait. Come back, refill the hole, wait a little bit again. Um, if that water drains within two days, you've got a good site. If that water is not draining and not moving in that soil, you're going to want to put that rain garden elsewhere because that soil is compacted and that rain garden is going to turn into a type of or pond really quickly. Um, we do see lots of clay soils here. So for us, thankfully, the native plants um, help break up that clay soil and loosen it, and they will help improve drainage over time. But again, it is worth doing the, um, the drainage test or the infiltration test there. 
So Department of Forestry has recommendations for soil mixes, standard soil mixes for the area. Um, if your budget allows it, um, sometimes it can be kind of a little more expensive to get that sand in there, but 50% sand, 25% um, topsoil, 25% compost or leaf litter. Um, mixing that together, that gives that, um, that area of the rain garden, that excavated site, um, nice fresh soil that will drain. Um, and again, it's not necessarily within everyone's budget to do that, um, but we can choose plants that will allow us to work within the budget if we can't amend the soil. Um, additionally, shredded hardwood is a great way to help reduce compaction over time. So not necessarily for your rain garden as well. You can recommend using it in your rain garden, but if you see areas in your yard that are exhibiting compaction, a layer of mulch, it's not an instant fix, but it definitely helps over time because you're adding that organic material back to the soil web. It'll slowly decompose. Um, mulching is a great first step and a really, you do it once and you wait and that's pretty much it. So that's a great area to kind of start addressing compaction issues in other spots of your yard as well. So when we choose plants, um, again, native plants that are going to take that inundation as well as those dry periods. Um, for native plants, I know you guys are familiar with what those are, but they're the regionally appropriate plants that were here before um, colonization and they're plants that have adapted to our ecosystem that co-evolved with our wildlife. And um, with that, they're gonna be adapted to our weather patterns. They're gonna be adapted to most of our soils and things like that. So they are um, going to be the good investment in terms of your long-term resources when it comes to gardening. Um, these native plants, they're going to require far less water than if we were to use annuals or exotic plants. Uh, we don't need fertilizers or pesticides to establish these. Uh, what we see with a lot of native plants, we use native prairie plants for our rain gardens quite a bit. If we think about prairie um, soil, they're open areas, they've got those deep, rich soils, but those prairie plants have really deep um, networking root systems, and that's why they work really well in rain gardens. Um, but they actually don't really like rich, nutritious soil. We found with those plants, like um, a lot of our ornamental grasses, rubecchias, black eyed susan, things like that, if you add a lot of fertilizer, or if you add a lot of compost to the soil, they tend to flop. So for our plants to be tidier and more upright, they like a nice lean soil, which works well in our area. Um, and then also I just love to remind folks that your time is also a resource as well. Um, you're saving yourself that effort. Most of our native plants, what we recommend for the perennials is leave them standing. You want to leave them standing for visual interest throughout the fall and winter. You want to leave them standing because that's the habitat for wildlife. Um, after things like purple cone flower blooms, um, traditionally a lot of folks would cut it back. Uh, we wanna leave that standing through the winter as well though, because those seed heads are gonna get picked clean by some goldfinches. Um, native plants are less maintenance in the long run. We recommend folks just set it, forget it. And then in, we start Valentine's Day-ish, because we have a lot more plants to cut back than the average person at the garden. Um, but late spring, cut your pl plants back once. Um, I also recommend if you're really ambitious, you can lay them out and mulch them through your lawnmower and then just throw that material back in the garden as mulch. Um, it keeps everything on site. You get that organic material and you don't have to bag trash anything. And um, if you want, I highly recommend mulching it or throwing it in a compost pile, but um, overall they're less work. And if you leave those plants standing throughout the winter, that's also going to inhibit weed pressure. So helps um, take space. So um, with that, I think I've got a visual on the next slide that shows you choosing native plants would have those deep root systems. Um, but if possible, we recommend ordering plugs. Um, landscape plugs are what we see in these pictures I have here. They're smaller, um, so they're easier to work with. They're faster to plant, but they establish faster and they have a much higher success rate of transplant. Um, these plants are much more resilient. They've got um, a little bit of growth at the top, and then they've got these nice deep root systems ready to go. And um, they're easy to design with. And like I said, it's super quick. Uh, the other thing that we find with landscape plugs um, versus you know gallon nursery pots, these plants aren't as mature yet and they don't have, um, I like to joke and think that they're like spoiled, but they haven't been spoiled their whole life in these nice tidy nursery pots that have the perfect soil mix and have all of that perlite and fertilizer added. Those plants have a little bit longer 
of an adaptation period, once you plant them, it takes them longer to acclimate. These, these landscape plugs, they're ready to go in the ground. They just grow a lot faster. Um, we do a sale in the fall where you can buy the landscape plugs kind of um, in native perennial kits, 15 plugs a piece. But um, if you have the opportunity to order landscape plugs, definitely recommend doing so. And then um, again, we want to avoid putting trees in our rain gardens. Um, we want these rain gardens generally to be in sunnier spots. I mean, some areas are gonna get shade, but if we think about that sun, um, it's going to help with that cycling of the water. Um, and we don't wanna add those trees necessarily um, because for homeowners, you're not gonna have the size of a rain garden that can accommodate a tree. Um, if, you're, if you have quite a large area of land, um, if you reach a certain size, a certain area of your rain garden, you can plug in trees. And that's where that calculator I send out to you guys kind of helps determine. But what I've found when working with homeowners, most of the time we're not going to have a rain garden or a property large enough to accommodate a rain, a rain garden that can fit a mature tree in it. Um, just to kind of recap, when it comes to these plants for rain gardens, we don't want to use invasive plants. Um, there is a definition of what is an invasive plant. Um, it is a presidential executive order. These plants cause economic and environmental harm, also harm to human health. Um, early detection is important. So you guys are like the first line of defense in what plants are invasive or what plants become invasive. And we actually just had the Virginia invasive plant list updated. And there's new invasive plants that have made it off early detection onto the higher priorities. So Nandina is one of them. Um, and that's what's pictured here. And I just put this little plug in here because it's nice to remind folks, especially a crowd like you all, that you guys are the ones that can make change and inspire other people to not purchase these plants or to ask your nurseries, things like that, to stock native plants and other ones. So um, just a friendly reminder, stay away from our invasive plants. Um, and there's a fun new DCR list um, that has caused some controversy. We've got Nandina's on it, butterfly bush has been added, um, Lariah, he made it up there. <laughs> so, But when we talk about the plants for our rain gardens, um, this is my favorite visual. I will sneak it into any class I teach. I will find a way. Um, this is from a wonderful book called Planting in a Post-Wild World. Um, but you can see how deep and branching these root structures are. So they are going to hold all that soil in place. They're going to filter so many pollutants out of the soil. But this is why they can withstand periods of high water and low water. When they have high water, ponding in a rain garden, they have a lot of root system that can soak that water up really quickly. But when they have periods of extreme drought, they have a very, very extensive branching root system that can find water and pool water from a wider range of areas. So they're very adaptable plants. That's why we love using them in rain gardens. They're great at breaking up that compacted clay soil. But this is the comparison. This is Kentucky bluegrass. So. And this is why this is why I use this visual. Like, you know, obviously we don't live out in Oklahoma and we're not going to have, you know, 14 feet down penetration from our roots and our plants here, but they're going to have a lot more impact than this tiny little root system here. So um, just a little inspiration again. Um, rethink your yard. Slowly maybe chip away at certain areas because, it's you know, getting rid of turf is tough. Um, but slowly each season, maybe make your flower beds a little bit bigger or add a little one and slowly expand it uh, little by little. Um, our rain gardens, we want to also think of them not as just green infrastructure tools, but they are little islands of pre for our wildlife. Um, the more rain gardens we have, uh, oops, the more rain gardens we have means the more plant diversity we have. Um, all of these plants, are gonna do a lot more for our wildlife in those little rain garden pockets than this turf will. So we've got all of these plants soaking up that water, holding that soil together. Then we've also got this diversity of textures for habitat, diversity of height for habitat. And then we've got diversity of food as well. And it also biodiversity means visual diversity as well. So um, urbanization in the US has been directly responsible for the endangerment of now it's over 300 species. Um, so these little pockets of rain gardens are not going to only act as sponges, um, but again, they're little sanctuaries. So has anybody been to the High Line in New York City? Yeah, it's the number one tourist attraction in Manhattan, and it is a garden, a very fancy garden. Um, but 
it is incredible to see the data that comes out of the Highline area and what wildlife has returned in that highly urban situation. Um, you guys live in a really beautiful area with still a lot of forested systems and a lot of green space, um, but we can continue to add resources that our wildlife needs because we are rapidly deforesting and expanding suburban sprawl, um, things like that. And so just adding these plants in our garden over turf can make a big difference for our wildlife. Um, I put in that picture of a peregrine falcon because I love watching the falcon cams. Virginia Beach Town Center usually has a pair that nested, but I can now officially say we have a pair that nested in downtown Norfolk. So <laughs> um, fun to see. They've actually adapted pretty well. And then also um, that is Liatris spicata. That is one of my favorite perennials to use. Um, I had it when I was in the children's garden, we had fields of it, but it would be coming up through pea gravel in the desert garden. And it would be coming up through an inch of water in our frog bog. And I have used it in downtown Norfolk in plantings where I only had eight inches of like clay sitting on top of concrete. <laughs> so that plant is indestructible and it is covered in pollinators during its flowering season. And then it is covered in goldfinches and songbirds once it goes to seed. So uh, Liatris piccata. Um, Cobold is a cultivar that's really popular, nice and compact. Um, you can buy it in gallon pots at nurseries, but it is much cheaper to get a bulb of corms. It looks like daffodil bulbs, almost like they look like bulbs, but you can buy a bag of them and get like 20 of them for the same price as one potted plant. So um, I've seen them more at uh, Home Depot and Lowe's now. Um, with our rain gardens, again, just highlighting the importance of including the um, native plants versus exotic plants. This is my favorite visual to show that co-evolution and why native plants are so important. Um, it's a female ruby-throated hummingbird visiting Lobelia cardinalis, which is cardinal flower. Um, this is the perfect rain garden plant, in my opinion. Um, Tall flower spikes, it naturally likes wet feet and shade, but we have some that is in a dry, full sunspot that is taller than I am, and I am 5'10", so um, that is a lot of red color, and um, it's amazing, but it's kind of one of those, if you plant it, they will come. Um, it is a magnet for our hummingbirds, and you can see it's like a puzzle. She perfectly fits right in there. So we've got that standard long tube red flower, that little bit of pollen at the top there, and it's just like a puzzle. And that ruby-throated hummingbird is the only thing that can successfully pollinate that plant in the wild. We might have incidental pollination, you know, accidental stuff from other pollinators, but that cardinal flower cannot continue on and survive as a species without the hummingbird. So um, it makes a really great rain garden plant, but it's also just the perfect visual for folks. Um, also, I realized I'm getting older and with my high school students, I made the reference of the Lion King where you like Simba, you know, got the um, paint from Rafiki. And I was like, it's like that with the cardinal flower, like the pollen just goes right on her head and she visits another and they're like, Rafiki, but it's like, come on, guys. <laughs> That's a very humbling moment for me. <laughs> um, and then this is just showing again um, another kind of. Um, I, I give this talk to a variety of audiences, so I understand you guys are pretty up to date and familiar with all this stuff. But it doesn't hurt for a little reminder. Um, those rain garden plants, when we have that high diversity of plants, it's going to enable not just the fun pollinators. I think you know butterflies usually get all of the love because they're showy and fun, but we have to support our native bee species and our other pollinators like flies and wasps and rain gardens are a great way to do that. Um, a lot of our bees, we have over 400 native bee species in Virginia. Lots of them are pollen specialists. You know, I think a lot of people are familiar with monarch butterflies and milkweed, but we have bees that are specialists and they feed their young certain pollen. Um, the Southeastern blueberry bee, needs native blueberry shrubs. So just kind of a cool relationship. And when you guys design these gardens at home, maybe look into, hey, what is the specialist bees? Can I put something in my rain garden that's gonna support them? Um, and then I just show the red bud leaf, not necessarily because unless, again, you have a lot of surface area, you can do a tree and a rain garden, but how many people have seen that damage on a plant? So those are leaf cutter bees, another native bee. And I use this as just kind of a segue to remind folks, like some damage is good. I'm never gonna defend a Japanese beetle defoliating anything because I've literally had nightmares of those. But when I see stuff like this in the garden, that is exciting because that means it's serving its purpose. Something is using it. Those little leaf cutter bees, they're never gonna defoliate your plant because they're not eating it. They take that and they chew a little piece off 
and they fly back to their nest and they use it like wallpaper, essentially. They line their cavity with it and it's really fun to see them fly off with it. So um, if you have a red bud, they really prefer that. But that's just my reminder to folks, like when you put in all of these amazing plants, um, you're gonna see some damage. You just have to kind of retrain your brain as to what damage is. Um, just wanted to highlight again, I'm sure a handful of you guys have seen this chart. I know it's not as fun as the roots, um, but it's very important. And just to quickly sum it up, we have the 20 most valuable woody and um, shrubs and perennial plants in supporting biodiversity. Um, Lepidoptera are moths and butterflies and skippers. So when we choose plants for our rain garden, we can kind of cross-reference this list. So solidago, goldenrods, asters, those plants will support over 100 different species of moths and butterflies. So not only are we slowing and curbing stormwater runoff and helping impact the positive health of our waterways, but we can also, again, use these as tools to help our wildlife. So um, if you guys do, just unrelated, if you wanna plant a tree in your yard or a shrub, oaks are not necessarily the easiest thing everybody can plant because they get kind of large, right? Um, but that's over 500 species, but you could fit in some blueberries. You could support not only that southeastern blueberry bee, but almost 300 different species of moths and butterflies. Blueberry shrubs, beautiful fall color, fruit, spring flowers. So um, I just use this chart to kind of show you guys when you get into the fun part of designing your rain garden, we want to choose some really economically valuable plants. Monardas are one of my favorite. I love these in a rain garden. Lobelia, again, um, we see irises are a really good one, black-eyed Susan. So it's just kind of a fun thing to see, you know, how many species can your rain garden support? Um, and then just to kind of round off the wildlife portion of it, 96% um, of our native songbirds rear their young on insects. They need a lot of bugs to raise these birds. And I'm sure some of you guys have read or listened to Tal Doug Tallamy lectures, but he is a professor at a University of Delaware focused in entomology. And um, he had some phenomenal grad students because they went out and they followed chickadees and they tracked their nests and what they feed and collected data. But they found the average chickadee, um, that tiny little bird, is going to need, depending on the size of the clutch, three to five eggs, they're going to need 5,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to rear that clutch. And guess what? Chickadees can have multiple clutches in a year. And that's just chickadees. How many insects do you think a woodpecker needs to get, you know, affiliated woodpecker? So, um, I just include this, it's a fun statistic, but it really kind of drives the point home that anytime we add anything in our garden, we really do want to make sure we're adding something that provides a lot of value. So again, rain gardens are a great way to incorporate these high value native plants uh, because not only are they going to function as the sponge, but they are going to serve as a buffet as well for a lot of our critters. So when we choose plants for the rain garden, um, generally rule of thumb, we want to make sure, um, one, for design and visual aesthetics, it's nice to have a good mix, high, low, medium-sized plants, but that also increases the functionality of our rain garden, too. Um, generally, we want to have our taller plants in the center of a rain garden or in the back, depending on how you're viewing it, where it is in your yard. Again, that's going to differ for every person. Um, but we want to make sure not only do we have it set up so visually it's appropriate for like what we want to see, but we want to make sure we have the moisture zones. There's going to be a high, medium, and low moisture zone. So with our rain gardens, again, they're like these shallow excavated depressions. Um, most places are going to say 12 inches deep, but for us here in our region, we stick to about eight inch max. So again, we're going to have all of that in that calculator I share with you guys to kind of plug your numbers in. But our rain gardens aren't really deep compared to other regions in the US. But again, it is that shallow little depression and what that means is water flows in and it collects and it's going to, there's going to be more water in the center, the lower zone longer. So the plants that are in that area are going to experience wet feet a little longer. So that's our high moisture zone. Um, the center, the deepest part of your rain garden is going to need plants that are the most moisture tolerant. Um, for us, that means Joe pie weeds are a phenomenal one. Joe pie weed, iron weed, that Eupatorium and Vernonia, those are really great because not only do they tolerate wet feet for a long period of time, they can tolerate that periodic drought, but they also have the height and the visual interest that we're gonna to wanna to see in the middle of that garden. 
Um, then we slowly move the perimeter of your rain garden is where you're going to see your plants that tend to be a little more dry than wet tolerant because we're not going to see water standing there for three days. Water's just going to pass by and through them. Um, but if it does flood completely, as it soaks in, those plants can still take it, but just not as much as they would if they were down here. So for those plants in the perimeter, I love using things like Asclepias tuberosa, Black Eyed Susans are another really great one. Um, I love incorporating bee balm and Monarda into a rain garden um, because they will move where they want to go. <laughs> um, Monarda is in the mint family and not to scare anyone off, it's not as aggressive as mint, but I like to think of those as budget friendly plants. You can plant it, let it grow on a season, chop it up, divide it, move it somewhere later. Um, so I like putting those in a rain garden because, again, they tolerate those extremes, but they'll fill in the gaps and outcompete the weeds for you. So they're also a really fun way to just get in vivid, bright colors like the magenta and pink and then support hummingbirds and butterflies as well. Um, when it comes to kind of designing your rain garden, though, I always recommend, you know, you might not be Picasso or you might not be Van Gogh, but draw it out, just sketch it. It'll help you get a better ideal um, idea just seeing it on paper. So you don't even have to do anything on the computer. I just draw blobs and I outline them in different colors at times. Just give yourself a visual and make sure um, you have everything laid out kind of how you want it before you start planting it in the ground. Um, so this, um, just showing again, another example of kind of sketching out rain gardens. So these are incredibly large ones, but um, these are some other really good plants to include in those. So um, again, Vernonia, ironweed, another phenomenal one. Pensamin digitalis is another great one for homeowners, that beard's tongue. Um, we see asters are a phenomenal addition, as well as colonies. Turtle, um, turtle heads are really great. We've got white turtle heads, which are, tend to be a bit taller. Pink turtle heads are the shorter ones. Iris versicolor is another uh, really great one to include in some of the high moisture areas. And then uh, this I just include Juncus effusus, common rush. Use caution. Um, that one is definitely something that will spread and fill in space. But um, I included this graphic with that as a reminder. Um, depending on where you put your rain garden, and I'll show you guys some examples. If you have a rain garden collecting outflow from the street, that means your rain garden is probably going to be close to the street or a sidewalk. Um, you may already have this issue, but people walk in their dogs and don't necessarily want them to pee on your plants. Um, Juncus effusus is very good at tolerating that, <laughs> um, that high nitrogen and salt. Um, but I've seen this um, in rain gardens where people that have that frequent issue, um, you can take uh, usually what it's called a pee post, and it's basically just like a concrete um, rectangle. There's all different shape, size, stuff you can get, but people will put that in their yard, they'll plant juncus around it, and one dog marks it, and then that's the only place dogs will use. So it'll leave the rest of your plants alone, um, and you don't have to worry about them getting, you know, constantly urinated on and dying from that. So if anybody has that issue in their neighborhood, that's kind of a good compromise with dog owners, because they're going to pee on it. But um, again, I just say that in the rain garden presentation, because if you are collecting things from the sidewalk or the street, you're probably going to have your rain garden pretty close to where people are walking by. Dogs are too. So when it comes to construction, again, please call me utility. You're excavating a shallow depression. We do not want to hit anything um, that is not visible at the time of design. Um, we want to keep our rain garden relatively level um, to avoid pulling at one end. Um, unless if you want, you can design it that way, um, but it's just going to take a little bit more research on your plant part or your plant side of stuff. So um, again, I usually give this to a more um, general audience. I feel like you guys have a much more, a stronger background and understanding of how to design and use plants. So um, you can be a little more creative with your design, but um, we want to make sure that the length of the garden generally perpendicular to the slope and the downspout. We want to make sure the longer side is facing uphill if we do have elevation change. Um, again, uh, for the size of this group, I'm going to email that calculation or that calculator for you guys to kind of help um, plug that in because I appreciate that there's such a large crowd, <laughs> but I can't individually work through it with you guys. Um, the big thing I think that people aren't going to get daunted by the fact they have to calculate surface area and stuff like that. And what people aren't necessarily prepared for, prepared for is the removal of turf. Um, 
that part is the hard part. Um, there's different methods, you know, folks can go out and spray, um, but you could smother your turf. You can do the cardboard method. You can put plastic sheeting over it and kind of let that solarize and things like that. So um, removing the turf, we want to keep that in mind when we are designing our rain garden because it's, you don't want to bite off more than you can chew at first. Um, I do have a question for the audience. What do we think is, this looks like a beautifully designed rain garden, right? We have an inflow area. We have a nice berm back here, but what do we think is the issue with this one? Yeah, it is way too close to that house. <laughs> so um, I would tell him he's doing everything right, except for that. I want to back it up just a little more, but I just, it's a visual to kind of show you. Um, we have that inflow area and in the middle of that kidney bean, but we have the inflow and on the opposite of the inflow, we have the burn. So in terms of the layout, he did right, just not in placement. Um, again, we want to use um, amended soil in the center of that rain garden. But as you dig out the depression, use that excavated soil to build that burn. So you can form that burn, you can kind of compact it and compress it together a little bit. And again, that's kind of like the back wall of your structure there. And for this, um, when we design it, this is something I've used in the garden. If you take a lot like twine, a garden hose or something like that, um, it might look really good on paper, but when you go to start like drawing, designing, laying out your rain garden, you might realize you want to tweak it or things like that. Um, using that construction twine or a hose kind of gives you a good visual to play with the perimeter. So, I mean, not even for a rain garden, but if you're just designing a flower bed, that's kind of a good um, trick to get a feel for it, like actually in your yard, what's it look like? You'll be like, ah, oh, this beautiful plant, it looks great on paper. And then you start trying to map it out. And this way you don't have to spray paint your yard and then change your mind and bow it instead of that. Um, nice temporary way to kind of feel out what you want the shape of your garden to be. Um, with the berm, if you have the ability to seed it or cover it with sod, um, recommend doing that because the longer you have those roots growing and penetrating that berm, the more they're going to hold it in place in the event of a high, high rain. Um, I actually like using um, smaller native species for that berm, like grasses. Um, Blue-eyed grass is a really good one. Um, that is a low, dense um, native grass with beautiful flowers and it'll bloom early spring through summer. Um, we have that growing in shade, full sun. It's just a tough plant, but it's nice and low. So it's good on the perimeter, but it's going to have a strong enough root structure to hold that berm in place. So I really enjoy using that one. Um, also carpet flocks. Anybody's familiar with that nice vivid spring color. It's, uh, it's evergreen, semi evergreen, depending where you are. It's nice, low, dense, bushy, so it'll keep the weeds at bay. But again, it's got a nice root structure that'll hold that berm in place. So a lot of traditional materials you see recommend seeding that berm, but you have a lot more creative opportunities for it. So again, my two top picks when I do this are Cisincrium, that blue-eyed grass, or carpet phlox, phlox subulata. Um, just showing some examples of these rain gardens. So obviously <laughs> this one is pretty intense. Uh -huh. This is a large scale one installed at a park. Um, this one is gonna be collecting a lot of water from a lot of different areas. So it's huge, but it also has a highly structured inflow. And we also see drainage. So this one actually has an under drain because they're going to collect so much water. So that's just to show you kind of the comparison of these highly engineered rain gardens in municipalities compared to the much more approachable ones that we can do at home. And you can see this isn't a really deep excavated rain garden. It's a nice little swale. That little depression though is going to give that area for water to collect. And then we've got um, Minarda, we've got Black-Eyed Susan, we've got Iris Versicolor, we've got Eupatorium, that Joe Pie. We've got these plants in um, this small rain garden in that depression. But also again, look at all the biodiversity, look at all the habitat, same deal here. So we see this one right off the street. It's allowing some water to inflow there. It's allowing some water to collect an inflow here. And what you can't see on this side is like there's a little bit of a swale depression that collects water from different sides of the property. Slowly just directs it into this depression here. So again, just showing you the creativity, because again, a lot of folks, when I was first learning and working and installing these, um, thought rain gardens were messy. I think a lot of us are familiar with native plants still get some of that pushback, but times have changed. 
Um, people are starting to really love and appreciate them. This one, um, I just thought it was unique, it's very square, but you can see um, it's a very shallow one. We've got um, low bushy grasses, got that Asclepias tuberosa. This is that cardinal flower as well. So um, depending on your design style, it's totally up to you. But not only again, is this collecting, soaking off sediment pollution, rainwater, but it's adding a lot of visual interest to your yard as well. Um, one thing, if you're really ambitious and you want to do this, um, you can um, reach out to your city and request a curb cut block. Um, I've seen this becoming more popular where you have, this is basically your inflow structure and it lets water permeate into a collection area. Um, this is what not to do. <laughs> so this just has a lot of water rapidly coming in and it's blown out the soil for multiple reasons. One, there's nothing to slow it down. So that water's just coming in and eroding the soil. Secondly, what are these five random patches of plants gonna do? <laughs> this is your friendly reminder. Plant as densely as your budget will allow because the more plants that we have in there, we have more roots and they're gonna hold that soil together faster. Also studies show that you can plant, the more densely you plant things, the better they establish, they kind of help each other. They have that increased humidity around each other. So um, plant as densely as your budget will allow because this is not going to hold that soil together. And if you do a curb cut block or you have specific inflow areas and you don't, you know, depending on how much water you're collecting, you want to slow it down because it's, you know, as your rain garden is establishing, you don't want it to blow the soil away. You don't want it to blow all that mulch away. So river rock, river stone, gravelly, the larger cuts of stone, having those right at your inflow area, just slow that water down and it has more obstacles to move over. So it's not going to move as quickly and erode your soil away. So uh, we see some of the rain gardens permanently include these that are constantly collecting a high inflow, like on the curb. But uh, we also see you can use those temporarily as your plants establish, and then you can just remove them later. But most residential folks I see just use that nice kind of tan mix of river rock and it blends in pretty well. And just to show some examples with these curb cuts in place. So um, this is probably the easiest one in terms of homeowners. We don't have any of that under drain and things like that, um, but it has this inflow into this nice deep depression here and that water then collects permeates. Um, also, if we see uh, public places start to adapt this, this is something that they will include because that's going to catch trash. Now, I think it's worthwhile as a homeowner, leave it open. That's the cheapest and most successful way, but also I would rather have trash collect in my flower garden that I can go pick out periodically than have it carry down the storm drain. So just something to keep in mind if you do take inflow off the street. And there's um, now more and more like rebate programs for homeowners for keeping stormwater on your property. So it differs for, you know, every city that a folk, uh, someone lives in, but there are more and more like uh, rebates that you can look at too. So how much stormwater you keep on your property or how much green infrastructure you have. So definitely look in the, into that um, for where you guys live. And then this is just to show a comparison. Um, a lot of cities are trying to adopt these models um, where they have those we would call these traditionally hellscapes when landscaping because they're highly compacted, they're covered in pollutants, people walk over them all the time, the sun beats down on them. Um, but using those as little pockets um, of infiltration, we're actually installing our um, Garden of Tomorrow. We have a parking garden and we're going to have huge tree canopy covered with all our parking spots. And underneath each of the trees is going to be a deep well of stormwater retention. So uh, there's a lot of really, really cool stuff on the horizon when it comes to managing our stormwater in public areas. And then lastly, kind of wrapping up just other ways to reduce our runoff. So rain barrels, downspout gardens, curb cut blocks, like I just mentioned, incorporating permeable porous paving, um, even lattice networking. Um, we see this in a lot of green buildings, um, supports fire lanes. So fire trucks, ambulances, all that good stuff. Um, there's a lot of options for slowing down that water on your property, not using plants. Um, so there's a lot of creative ways you guys as homeowners can keep that water on site. Um, with that, I know I talk fast. I had a lot I wanted to get through to you guys. Um, I shared two links, the YouTube one. I'm going to send this out to you guys with that calculator, but that was just the, um, the drainage, the infiltration test. 
Um, so you guys could kind of visually see what that looks like. But I want you guys to jot down this email that ask a plant question at nbgs.org. It's a free tool for anybody. Um, you can ask us any kind of question. It could be, why did my plant die? It could be like, hey, I just heard the rain garden presentation and this is a picture of my property. What's a good, where's a good place to start? It could be, what is that cool bird that I just saw? I love getting those kind of emails, but that email puts you in direct contact with our education team and our horticulture team. And not many people use it. So you usually get a pretty detailed, thorough response <laughs> pretty quickly. Um, so please feel free to use that. Um, there's a lot of really cool programs out there for homeowners. Ask HR Green is a great one. I've done a lot of rain barrel workshops with them. Sometimes they're free, sometimes they're 25 bucks. Um, but there's a lot of resources for retaining your rain on your property. Um, if you have large scale ambitions or you are a business owner um, and you want to have a little bit more of a sustainably landscaped um, yard, Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional has a database for designers and businesses that practice all these sustainable techniques, such as managing and installing rain gardens. Um, but with that, um, I know I went a little bit over, but I know it's an introduction. Um, it's just really hard because all of this is so specific to what each person's yard and site looks like. So um, you guys will have my email address. So when you get that calculation um, link, that tool, um, and you want to reach out to me and you have specific questions, I'm happy to go through that with you guys. But uh, I'm just very excited. There's such a large amount of you today. This is great. Well, thank you, guys. I'm so happy to come to this side of the water Christmas. Thank you for watching this presentation by the James City County Williamsburg Master Gardener Association. Please visit our website for more educational videos at jccwmg.org.